Today on the Everything 80s podcast, the rise and fall of the Kodak Company. Hey there, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s podcast. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out today. So I'm not sure when you grew up, but a big part of growing up in the 80s were physical pictures and cameras. Today we look at them almost like antiques and to have a physical print, it seems almost vintage. The thrill of dropping off film to be developed and then picking it up was like a mini Christmas. Some of the thrill was the anticipation of it all. Uh, Were your photos any good? Did you capture what you hoped you would capture? Today, there is, of course, no risk of missing the shot or the moment. The phone you're probably listening to this on is basically a professional photography studio. You can take 9,000 shots of something and then edit it with more tools at your disposal than professionals had just a decade ago. It's kind of weird these days to hold a physical print in your hand. And I was looking at some of my sister's wedding photos the other day, and I'm I'm not kidding, but on one of the pictures, I wanted to see it, like, I wanted to zoom in, and I actually went to pinch and zoom on the physical picture the same way you would on your phone or your tablet, which is a very bizarre feeling to have done that. We're so used to seeing photos on screens that it almost seemed primitive that they were even on paper. It almost seems like it's a step up from cave paintings. But filming cameras were a huge part of the 80s, and one company ruled them all, the Kodak Company. So this is a look back on the rise and fall of this huge corporation that was responsible for creating the industry. They actually helped to evolve it, which we'll get to um, later on in the podcast. And then they bowed out in sort of spectacular fashion. So it's a look back on everything to do with Kodak. But before we start, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcast. I should be there. Okay, here we go. So this whole story isn't obviously directly only connected with the 80s it goes back a hundred years it goes back um you know to the 50s the 60s the 70s but it you know photography and photos were a big part of growing up in the 80s and again for all these decades Kodak and pictures went hand in hand for many people there was no other significant brand when it came to photography but here's you know just looking a little deeper After dominating the photo landscape for so long, they had 90% of all film sales and 85% of camera sales in the 70s. I mean, you just, you can't not think of Kodak and photography. It just, they're synonymous with each other. But, you know, like I said, Kodak faded into the background. How could this industry juggernaut disappear? And this will get into the digital photo revolution. Were they not paying attention to what the market wanted? Um... Were they just ignorant? Was it a bit of both? That's everything we're going to look at. But first is just the quick backstory on Kodak itself. Started as the Eastman Kodak Company all the way back in 1888 when it was founded by George Eastman. His strategy was simple, but also very brilliant. Sell inexpensive cameras, but make most of his money from the consumables needed to use one, notably the film, the chemicals, and the paper. So Kodak, of course, dominated most of the 20th century as photography became more accessible. Their dominance of the market allowed them to be ubiquitous with with photography itself. This domination led to one of the most iconic phrases in marketing and in just society in general, a Kodak moment, which embraces capturing the special moments in life. That expression is still used today. With you know, a lot of people not even sure what that means, and I think it'll continue to be used for decades to come. And like I mentioned, there was a time when you could only get your pictures back from the developer, and it would take weeks. You can still obviously get printed pictures, but that involves you know, say, take them to your like um, USB drive or your thumb drive to a Walmart, um, loading it up, but that you still are able to you know edit and 
um, go through all your shots before you decide which one. Like I said, you can take the 9,000 shots before you decided what to keep. Back then, it was an absolute risk uh, with every shot you take, and you had no idea if it was going to turn out till you actually got them back from the developers. So, you know, through the 20th century, Kodak was king. And not only was Kodak a pioneer in film and photography, they were also innovators. And that gets into the whole move into the digital world. And that's, you know, most people would be thinking, of course, they faded away because of everything to do with digital cameras. But that's really not the case because Kodak were the ones who actually pioneered the digital camera all the way back in 1975. If you do like a Google Images search or whatever, just look up first digital camera. And it kind of looks like, I'm looking at it right now, it was sort of blue, it had a cassette tape attached to it on a big stand. It kind of looks like an x-ray machine, is probably the best way you could describe it. But look it up, obviously not a sleek, compact unit, but the fact is they could capture photography in a digital form all the way back in 1975. But the development of this technology is what would lead to their downfall. Digital products were now starting to emerge in the marketplace and Kodak worried how this new technology would affect its bread and butter, which was physical film. If you remember, again, if you grew up in the 80s or you know early 90s or 70s or whatever, like I said, cameras weren't that expensive. Like I remember being kind of... Sub- like good cameras are obviously always expensive, but you could get those simple point and shoot cameras, those little snapshot ones, you remember that looked like kind of like a big Kit Kat almost, you know what I mean? It maybe had the little pop-up flash or the little slide thing that would turn the flash on. Very simple and very cheap and you could buy them anywhere because the concept was essentially the same across the board. It just came down to the quality of the film usually and then obviously past that things like lighting and everything. But Kodak made the best film. So there was a better shot at your pictures actually turning out very well. But the development wasn't cheap. If you remember, the cost of the actual film itself was quite a bit. And then the development to get them done. And, you you know, so you wouldn't be taking them every other day. It would be sort of like a special occasion thing. And I remember getting myself getting um, cameras at Christmas or something like that with a roll of film. And it was amazing because you could take your own pictures. Usually each family had the one camera and you really had no say in what the shots were going to be. Or, you know, you would maybe get to take one picture and you'd have to beg to do it because the roll of film had only 24 exposures. Sometimes you could get like the 36, but I think that lowered the quality a little bit. I'm not a photography expert. But, you know, with the family camera, it was (laughs) sort of like a special treat to be able to take one shot, maybe two shots, because every shot was so precious. So to get like your own camera and your own film to take whatever you want was an incredible gift but again it wasn't that cheap and again that's where kodak is making the majority of their money because of the um consumables kodak even though they invented the digital camera they ended up dropping it as they didn't want to put out anything that would risk jeopardizing their photographic film business even though they owned it they didn't want to be in competition with themselves which seems sort of weird so of course digital photography would evolve and the digital landscape as a whole and as an industry definitely didn't happen overnight with the cameras because you know with any new technologies that come out they're prohibitively expensive and only a few people usually get them you know when it was say the tv itself or when vcrs came out they were the original vcrs in the late 70s early 80s cost the equivalent of around fifty five hundred dollars so not a lot of people would have them same thing with cd players when they first came out no one really had one dvd players blu-ray over enough time the technology uh, becomes more affordable the components become cheaper and then there's more competition as well with other companies giving their their own offerings which may not be as good but sort of lower the price down so of course no one would have a digital camera for more than a decade Um, and even then they were super expensive so not accessible to everyone But again, you know, like any form of technology and new industry, it gradually grew. So Kodak, of course, is aware of the growing evolution and development of digital photography because they created it after all. But they, you know, eventually decided they had to join this party that they invented. Uh, This is the whole bizarre thing of this entire topic and, and look back at Kodak is them 
creating something almost like them being uh, Dr. Frankenstein and creating this thing that got so out of control that should have been in their control the whole time. So as they join the, the party, I guess, they planned a 10 year long approach to move into digital technology. In the meantime, they even helped Apple make a digital camera in 1994. And most people don't um, think of this. And it could have been another thing that Apple could have completely dominated in another entire industry, which they eventually would, you know, with iPhones and all forms of um, digital photography. But, you know, not only did they pioneer, you know, MP3s and digital music, they almost had the chance to do this as well, too. I just, I don't know if it's something they took that seriously. The phone, sorry, the camera they had made for them by Kodak was called the Quick Take. And that was that digital camera in 1994. And again, maybe just a little bit too ahead of its time. If they'd waited a couple years, they could have taken over the whole industry. You never know. Technology is sort of a, such a hit and miss thing. So again, back to Kodak, they would put out some basic digital cameras in 1996, but kept marketing to a minimum. And this would be a problem that would lead to the downfall, which we'll get to in a bit. Basically, they did not foresee a world without traditional film. So they had no reason to stay away from that. And it's not to say that physical film or traditional film or whatever doesn't exist. It, it will always exist. But now, like I said, it's a very niche thing. It's more, it's more art, if anything. You know what I mean? And people... Um, the idea of like dark rooms and everything like that, the whole industry has evolved and changed and there will always be a need for physical prints. But like I say, you're more likely to see them in an art gallery um, and a display um, and, you know, like a curation of them or whatever. And, you, and you, know, you still have them on your wall and whatever. And like I said, you can print them off at Walmart. But as far as, you know, newspaper photography or sports, of course, everything is digital. So, you know, the, they're, they're sort of dipping their toe into the digital photography world and taking their time with a long drawn out plan. But the digital photography is growing and growing very quickly. And of course the concept of being able to take as many pictures as you want and delete them on the spot, changed the way people could interact with their world. Consumers were now migrating over to digital cameras, especially to companies like Sony who were capitalizing on the photography evolution. Again, depending on your age, I don't know when you would necessarily get your first digital camera or whatever, but Sony really kind of took over things in the 90s and, uh, again, made things cheaper. They're also like pioneers in anything technology-wise anyway, and they're seen as like an indus industry standard for other forms of technology. So they took that as well as when it was becoming more accessible, costs were going down, and they created a real... Um, sort of movement as well with really good ads and really good marketing and promoting how your world should be more digital. Again, sort of happening while Apple's doing their thing as well too. So the whole landscape is sort of shifting. So no, now Kodak is trying to play catch up here. So Kodak was able to infiltrate the digital camera market. They just failed to accept that tradition and technology can exist together. And that's sometimes the problem with these companies that have roots more than a hundred years ago. Again, this goes back to 1888 and they're, you know, these old companies are sort of based in these fundamentals and they have a tough time straying from that. I don't know if they think they're betraying their roots or getting away from what got them to where they are. But in this case, it was just not having the foresight or um, the insight to see that tradition and technology can exist. That to them, it was very binary. Like it has to be one or the other. It has to be black and white. And we know that's not the case. So when it comes to digital cameras, you might remember this one. They put out their Easy Share brand. And they spend a ton of time actually doing market research too. Like, you know, they're, again, they're pioneers and they were, they revolutionize an industry that wasn't a mistake. They knew how to do their research. They knew how to look at the market. So when they're finally getting a little more serious about digital cameras, they did their research. Their findings showed that women were the major force behind digital camera sales, but they didn't like the slow upload process to computers. Again, if you grew up during this time or experienced anything, you know how painful that was the upload process. Now, every of course, everything's like instant again, depending on <clears throat> internet connections um, determine 
how well your technology works or things that are cloud uploaded or whatever. But those early days, it was painful to upload stuff. It was so slow. And most computers had trouble processing images of that quality and size. I remember like some of the early computers I had, just they couldn't handle anything like that, let alone video they couldn't touch. A lot of images had trouble. Um, they were just too dense and, and required too much data. So that was the thing. They're, they're selling these things, but um, the people buying them just don't like the process of having to upload them to computers. So now Kodak tries to switch things up. They, what they did is pushed out new products and specifically printer docks. By 2005, they were number one in U.S. digital camera sales, making $5.7 billion. And that's because they saw how <clears throat> you know, people wanted this easier process instead of having to upload everything. They wanted that traditional meets technology. So they were kind of you know, embracing it here. So people wanted, they still wanted that physical print, and they wanted to put it on their wall, and they wanted to make photo albums, and they wanted... Uh, to put them on the fridge, but they just didn't like having to use too much technology. So now they had the digital camera, they could use a Kodak printer dock and then sort of cut out the middleman, if you will. Of course, they weren't the only ones that created these type of printer docks, but because they were the industry leader, it was a lot easier for them to sell. And like, you know, by 2005, they were dominating a lot of things to do with digital technology and photography. Again, this is awesome, but Kodak was still not recognizing how fa fast this market was growing. 5.7 billion sounds like a ton, and it is, but it's kind of you know becoming a smaller piece of the whole thing. And it's I, I don't know if it's again ignorance by the heads of giant companies like this just to not recognize what's going around them. The problem is they were following that old model again you know where they made the money in the in, in the consumables and you know this time it was maybe a bit of the printer docks um the the cartridges and the ink needed um the the physical paper uh, some you know money made on the, the digital cameras the problem is that what happened was they started losing money on every camera sale because, again, they're trying to navigate this thing as they were going. And the other problem is now, like I said, as technology changes, competitors start coming in and they start coming in cheaper. And they, you know, maybe they're not as good, but, you know, when it comes to the brand new technology, you just want to be a part of it all. So you'll get whatever and you're probably going to take the cheaper option. I know I did anyway. And through this whole thing, they're still hung up on traditional film and they refuse to step away from that and focus on what is clearly the complete change of the industry. They're holding on like, like with grim death to traditional film. So of course, now we're going to look at the demise of Kodak because of all this. So it starts in around 2007. Kodak was now number four in camera sales. By 2010, they were in seventh and holding just 7% of all sales. Now they've got the other big problem that smartphones and tablets could now take pictures and fewer people needed a digital camera. Uh, I don't know what phones or cameras you've had, but you know, there was that little while where you had your cell phone and you had your digital camera, you know, almost everyone had a digital camera and now they're starting to merge together and the smartphone is becoming the camera. They don't need the digital camera anymore. When it came to buying a digital camera, it wasn't just Kodak that ran thing every more uh, ran things anymore. And again, they're sort of more associated with film as opposed to physical camera. So now you got Sony, Nikon, and Canon, which are ubiquitous with physical cameras, and they had the market cornered. Sony, in particular, would put out ads that really captured this digital movement. And they rarely even talked about the camera they were advertising. They marketed it as being a necessary part of like a hip lifestyle. This was something Kodak never bothered to do. They were still, you know, thinking back to the days of the 60s and 70s and just touting the physical benefits of their physical products and the technical specs. Sony was smarter, kind of like Apple. They saw the movement happening and wanting to capture um, the spirit of that movement. So they're not, they're 
and that's always sometimes the signs of good advertisement is they're not necessarily even pushing the product and you don't even realize that they're selling the idea and they're selling the feeling and like you know you can go to a party and you can capture all those moments um, and then relive them later and kind of what helped Facebook evolve so much you know taking the idea of life and putting it online and it just again really smart marketing helps um, at the forefront of a movement. Again, Kodak never bothered to do anything like this, even though they were seeing it happening all around them. So now they're scrambling. It's 2010. They finally actually have to shut down their film division. They cut 27,000 jobs, and now they put most of their money into technology. They also invested hundreds of millions in a printer ink business to replace the declining film sales. They're still hanging on to this idea. Again, we, we still, you know, you still love the physical prints and they're just thinking a world will never not have physical prints. So they sort of double down on this whole thing where it's clear everything is either online or on the devices, but they're just refusing to let go of that. Of course, it was too late. They rapidly used up all their cash reserved and reserves and declared bankruptcy in 2012. And this is the whole sort of point of the podcast is, and this topic is looking at what business was Kodak really in. And that's what they failed to ask themselves. Throughout this digital revolution, they were convinced that they were just in the film and camera business. But as photography grew, we saw that it was about more than just technology and tools. It was about capturing our lives. The business that Kodak was really in was sharing life's moments. And I mean, they did sort of create that idea with it's a Kodak moment, but then they didn't ever expand on it or they didn't ever let it develop or embrace it. Pictures were a way to tell and share life stories. This wasn't about film and technology. It was about creativity, art, love, and now easily being able to share it with the world in a digital capacity. And of course, with social media growing and being able to instantly share those moments of your life. Photography was now moving beyond digital even. It was becoming social because of the, all the social networks. Kodak was so focused on selling products and following these sort of outdated models from the 60s and 70s and, and also so, again, hung up on preserving their film business that they failed to embrace this new movement. The new movement was the one that they had ironically created. They had the chance to have sold the past and the future. It didn't have to be one or the other, and that was something they just could never get past. So I'll start winding it down here. Like any big industry, the, the, and this could be a story uh, a decade or two from now with, say, Apple and the same thing happening. I mean, you just can't picture that they would never not be on top. Same thing with Kodak. They always thought they would be the number one game in town. And they were also afraid to compete with themselves because of this. They failed to see how this new technology was enhancing customers' lives. And when they finally acknowledged it, it was too late. Since they were too focused on selling products, they didn't sell the lifestyle or value that people were looking for. A company must stay aware of its customers' needs, and the focus can't just be on the product. Kodak failed to see that just presenting their products was not enough. What they needed was customer engagement, which they failed to provide, but other companies like Sony did. Even though they were the innovators, they were complacent. They didn't observe what was happening around them and failed to reinvent themselves. So it ends up just, you know, not being the Kodak moment they were looking for without making it too cheesy. But I'll finish it there. Hopefully you like this. Hopefully it, you know, maybe a bit of a history lesson, but also a look at an industry juggernaut, which was a big part of the 80s and a big part of, um, you know, people growing up in your childhood. And it all has to do with memories and it all has to do with um, capturing those memories. And that will always be a thing. But just the medium and the way we do it has changed and evolved. But, you know, at the core, it's still about preserving and holding on to those moments. So thanks for listening. I uh, hope you like this. If you haven't already, again, subscribe wherever you find your podcast. I should be there. If you really like the show, leave it a rating and review. That always helps. But I will be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.